This is the tale of two cities reshaping the conversation of safer street design. We have a really exciting presentation for you today. Um, I want to introduce our panel, or our presentation. Uh, first, uh, Kathy Tuttle with the Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Don Ho Chang, who is the city traffic engineer with the city of Seattle. And Grace Young, who is the bicycle and pedestrian planner with Trailnet. My name is Chris Saliba. I'm an associate with Alta Planning Design, and I'm also a volunteer with Ballard Neighborhood Greenways. Kathy, I'm going to hand it off to you to, to kick off our, our presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Uh, thank you for choosing to come to this session. I know there are 10 other sessions I'd rather be at. <laughs> so even though this is the best session, so, so you made the right choice. But, but there are some wonderful things happening uh, right now at, at Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place. So thank you for being here. So we're going to talk about two different cities. Uh, part of the, the joy of putting this presentation together was that we got to, to, to hear from another city and kind of compare notes. And, and, and so it was really great to, to see what was going on. Uh, the Seattle context starts with uh, my organization. So I'm the executive director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Uh, we have a paid staff of four and at least 100 incredibly active volunteers uh, who are very uh, neighborhood focused. They're, they're looking very much at the, at the hyper local street safety improvements that they can make in their own neighborhoods to make it safer to walk, uh, bike, and sometimes drive. Uh, we look at street safety in the Seattle context. So all that fine type that you see on that Seattle map uh, is small local groups with people in them that are working hard to make safer streets. So that's what our paid staff does, is, is engage those community groups and try to work with them to decode the, the Byzantine laws of the city of Seattle and actually put safe streets in practice. So we got very excited about Parking Day. Parking Day is coming up this Friday uh, all over the world uh, and decided that it would be a great opportunity to start doing some of the projects that we were already doing with tactical urbanism and turn them into a, a much more kind of structured uh, safe street opportunity. In, uh, so, so, so what we did uh, is, is copy what a lot of our local groups were already doing and packaged up some of the, the actions that they were doing into a design competition and then actually used some of the things that they produced to actually turn those projects into actual built projects. So, so the, this is an example of what we have been doing with our parking day. This was in 2014. Uh, the picture on your right uh, is a safe street rechannelization. Uh, Don't know we'll be talking more about this, uh, but on the Cowan Park Bridge in North Seattle, uh, people put in protected bike lanes, uh, closed a slip lane, and did a lot of uh, a, a little parklet and did a whole lot of traffic safety improvements in this one little corridor in Seattle. Uh, SDOT came along, Seattle Department of Transportation came along, and actually for a variety of reasons actually implemented a lot of these traffic improvements the following year. We were so excited about the success of this program that we decided to put together a design competition. So we put out uh, notices to community members that we were going to be sponsoring a design competition uh, for Parking Day uh, that had to do with tactical urbanism projects. The, uh, we had over 30 applications for that design uh, competition. And what we promised to do was to expedite permitting and provide resources so that people could build these tactical urbanism projects in Seattle. The, the grand prize, first prize winner among the 30 applications, we only could afford to support five of those 30 projects, uh, was protected bike lanes on the most dangerous street in Seattle. Uh, Don Ho was not crazy about this idea because it was the most dangerous street on Seattle and it was 2,000 linear feet of protected bike lanes 
on a very dangerous street um, that the community designed and made safe enough for young children to be able to walk, uh, walk along the sidewalks and to do uh, biking on this street. So, as I said, we put together five projects during that parking day, that first parking day competition in 2015. Uh, another one of those projects that we, that we supported was a safe roadway crossing. Uh, Seattle is known for the Burke Gilman Trail, uh, a protected uh, multi-use trail uh, that kind of runs the length of Lake Washington in the center of Seattle. Uh, and this was just a back of the envelope drawing that a community member had done for a street safety project. And this is the project that uh, he came up with. And that uh, the, the thing that we were doing uh, after that we've been learning over the years too is to start getting more buy-in from uh, local businesses and local institutions. So this particular project was not only supported by the local Greenways groups, the volunteer active transportation advocacy groups, but it was also supported by uh, Seattle Children's Hospital and then the local market that was right there. So there was already community buy-in for doing this one-day uh, active transportation, active urbanism project. So, it, so, so what the city is doing, which is extremely exciting, is I think they took a look at this napkin that this local advocate had done and turned it into uh, some very colorful street uh, stencils that are going to go in as a curb, you know, low-cost curb extension at this trail crossing. I can't wait to actually see it in, in, uh, in action. It's going to be put in this fall. And again, this was a huge uh, step from going from, you know, one of the winners of our parking day competition to going into uh, street improvements in 2016. And then I just couldn't end without saying what we're doing this year. Again, we're really evolving how we're engaging community, not only with the local neighbors and getting buy off from local neighbors, but really uh, getting a lot of involvement from local businesses. This particular parking day uh, project will be put in this Friday and Saturday because now we've convinced the Department of Transportation to let us keep our parking day projects up for two days. <laughs> two days. We're really working again with the city. We're all, I'm always nudging Don Ho. Just give us a little more. Just give us a little more because we'd love to keep these things up for a week or even a month or actually permanently. Um, but what we're doing with these projects is, is giving the community a chance to see how it feels to give the Department of Transportation a, a, an opportunity to see what it's like to have active transportation, you know, low-cost active transportation pop-ups happen on, on the street. So this particular project is going to have two parklets, and you can see the little sketches of them. And uh, we're also collecting data. Uh, we have already, we have, uh, cameras set up and we're testing failure to yield and uh, speeding at, at those. So every one of those four corners with a little orange stripe around them uh, is uh, where a local business is located. Every one of those four businesses is completely bought into this, and this is on a major arterial. Uh, every one of those four businesses is bought into these street safety improvements, and you know, I'm hoping that we'll have great data and do won't be able to say no to actually making this uh, intersection improvement in the next year or two. So that's the story of what our organization is doing to move forward with street safety projects, um, kind of piggybacking on an already existing program that is Parking Day. And we have other tactical projects we're doing as well, but it's great to have this very collaborative effort between community and, and the city and local businesses uh, to actually make changes in the in the world right away. So thanks. Hi again. My name is Chris Saliva. Uh, I'm a design associate with Alta Planning Design, and I'm a resident of the Ballard neighborhood in Seattle. And um, I worked on a project in uh, the Ballard neighborhood that received one of the, the five uh, cohorts that Kathy mentioned. Uh, about uh, for getting support to implement one of uh, our temporary installations. 
And as she mentioned, this was part of a design competition, and we were able to install the project during parking day in 2015. So this was last September 19th, which was my birthday, um, September 18th and 19th, and it was up for two days. So it was up for parking day, and then we were able to keep it up for the next day, which was our first summer parkway um, in Seattle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our specific project and, and how we did it, and where we're going from it, and where we're going and moving forward. Um, so the project is the red line. Oh, sorry. I should say the red line is uh, 6th Avenue Northwest. Uh, 6th Avenue is, um, has been identified as a future neighborhood greenway um, uh, in the 2013 bike master plan. And so what that means is it's, it's a safe route for people walking and biking, slow residential streets. The challenges along the, the corridor are the intersections. There's a few intersection crossings that um, signalized and there are some that are unsignalized. Along the corridor there are four schools. So this is a really uh, strong and primary route uh, that kids and families take to school. And some people might know that Seattle uh, would challenge with topography. Um, and Sixth Avenue actually is a, is a nice gentle grade uh, that's going north-south. So we kind of have this tribal knowledge that's kind of bubbled to the top that has identified Sixth Avenue as a preferred uh, walking and biking route uh, because it's, the grade is a little bit more gentle. Um, and we just, it just happens that four schools are located along this corridor as well. The red dot is identifying the 6th and 65th crossing. So this is the, the intersection uh, that we're focusing on for our project. And the challenge with the intersection is that it's a jog. So the east-west street here, 65th, is an arterial, and 6th Avenue north-south jogs. So the challenge is, is that you need to ride your bike in the roadway in order to uh, continue north and north-south. So with that design challenge, we came up with a temporary solution, or a solution to illustrate um, how to solve the problem, and that is to provide a two-way protected bike lane on the north side. <laughs> on the north side of 65th. And so this was a sketch that we put together, submitted it to Seattle Neighborhood Greenways um, for them to evaluate. And they, um, they awarded uh, our project as one of the projects that would move forward. And what that really meant was is that Kathy and Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, we're going to advocate and work on our behalf with uh, collaborating with SDOT to get the project installed. So permitting, providing materials, providing logistical support to help us make it happen. This is a, a, a photograph of the existing conditions. Um, so there's parking on the north and the south side of the roadway. So north here, south here. And there's some challenges. On the south side, there's a, um, a collision repair center, and there's a couple of driveways. But there's a limited amount of curb space, so there's not really um, good on-street parking because the curb's already interrupted. But we have the challenge of this in and out traffic of those driveways. So this is something we, are, we you know, identified as a potential concern. And then on the north side, there's on-street parking, but it's not um, it's utilized only during certain times of the day. And, uh, and uh, on-street parking on adjacent residential streets is, is, is uh, highly controlled. Um, so we could potentially mitigate the loss of parking on the north side onto the adjacent residential streets. So here we are on parking day uh, installing a, our, what turned out to be a one-way uh, protected bike lane. What we, uh, in, in working with SDOT, one of the criteria that we needed um, to work within the, the seven feet of the uh, existing um, parking area. So we weren't able to get a two-way in there. That was okay, because we were able to demonstrate, at least in one direction, how the protected bike lane could work. We had some, we had people 
using the, you know, the, the bike lane, uh, we were pretty excited to kind of talk with folks that were coming through. Uh, we used pretty low-tech uh, low uh, materials. Um, we did need to uh, take up the protected bike lane after day one and then reinstall it on day two. So the paper kind of worked pretty well for us um, like for kind of marking the green uh, left-hand left turn lane. Although it was a little slippery. Some more images of folks using the, the bike lane. And one thing that's very important here is that you know, we were working really strongly to get the protected bike lane. and. Secondly, we were working to get um, a crosswalk uh, in an uh, existing business district. So this is a mid-block crossing. And one of the discoveries um, during the, our, uh, our project and that it was up was that the crosswalk was really powerful and successful in slowing traffic. I have a couple of theories why. Um, one was SDOT put out these A-frames with stop signs and they were on the edge of the parking lane. So that really kind of uh, pushed in the perceived width of the roadway. And I think it was, it was really successful in helping uh, kind of uh, with traffic coming. Um, but we were also getting a lot of pedestrians using the crosswalk uh, during business hours. And as I was mentioning, one of the things that uh, Kathy helped us with was Making, making, get, getting us connected to SDOT. And SDOT actually came out and installed um, this temporary crosswalk uh, the evening before. So it was this really nice partnership between uh, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways organizing a design competition, local volunteers coming up with a design, partnering with SDOT to install um, elements such as the, the, the crosswalk. Um, and then moving forward, we are continuing to work with Summer Jocelyn, I think I saw her walk in, um, to refine the design, uh, which will now be a two-way protected bike lane on both the north and the south side, and this is slated to be installed next summer. Now I'd like to pass it off to Don Howell. So I have the best job in the world because I have such a amazing community members to serve and they do a lot of the work for us. Um, so really, you know, our job is to collaborate and make sure that we provide the facilities to serve the public need, right? So um, we always have to go back to where our mission is. Really, this is a quality transportation system for people in Seattle and we're really trying to connect people. We've heard about that today, right? Great happiness. Uh, places and products. And our core value, we want safety, and safety for our community. Uh, they're connected, affordable, and vibrant, and we use innovation. Uh, and the last thing is that we want equity. We want to make sure that our resources are really distributed equitably so that it's not really the uh, connected, uh, the get people got the means, that as these uh, uh, projects become successful, we want to create a, a template so that it can be utilized throughout the community and that we are equitably uh, providing our services throughout the city. So 2014, uh, we uh, had an opportunity to work on parking day. So this is uh, Kellogg Place uh, at 15th Avenue. And if you look at this location here, there's a park in the side, nice uh, uh, ravine and green belt. Uh, this is a uh, bridge across 15th Avenue and uh, a very challenging crossing. Um, and so this is a location where uh, the community said, oh, we make some improvements here across the bridge. The way that it functions is a uh, almost a two-lane cross, four-lane across this bridge. Uh, our municipal club allows people to uh, use both lanes if they're sufficient width. And here are our heroes uh, who uh, said, "Let's make it better." Um, and we saw Kathy. Uh, they uh, uh, created a, uh, a separation from the vehicle lane to where bicycles can be, and uh, created a little space here on the corner uh, for. Uh, using that crossing distance, right? So, so it's a great community project. What this really does for us is that uh, it shows the community what can be put in place. When this is in, in place, the traffic flows just as well, right? So that's another demonstration that it's not the end of the world. Uh, it's 10 functions go uh, very well. Uh, one thing that we did notice was that our police department stopped by and said, what are you guys doing here? <laughs> they asked to see the permits, right? So even uh, even in our own uh, departmental uh, uh, slope pipes, you know, we, we need to improve uh, upon our uh, communication. Uh, these are very successful uh, demonstrations that allows us to
see how things work, and then see if we can implement them. In 2014, so after, uh, my director, Scott Kubley, came online uh, uh, in 2014, and we actually uh, went out and visited the site. Um, we uh, had a change in our uh, bridge calculation in 2015, and this bridge, since it was four lane, uh, four lane facility, it was rated as structurally efficient. Um, we had to, because buses travel on this corridor, uh, uh, we had to go ahead and uh, uh, restrict buses and trucks on this, on this uh, bridge. But the solution to us uh, very quickly was that we can implement what was presented, which is uh, eliminate the second lane. And now the, the structure of the bridge is set in very strong in the middle, but this is being maintained. So this is very quickly implemented, um, and it gave us an opportunity to uh, really look at long-term improvements. So this 15th was a north-south street. We want to make this improvement connection here. Um, Again, it's a very challenging location for us as staff, but you know, if we could make this an always stop, it would really make this function better for people. Uh, if you look at our, our guidance standards, uh, you have to have certain volumes of uh, uh, vehicles uh, on our Main Street and Side Street, it did not meet that. But, you know, as engineers, we could create, right? So what if you turn that in its head and said, you pick the Main Street and you square it up? Now your Main Flow and Main Flow becomes a Side Street. It needs to criteria, because that's what we did. You can see this is the main uh, street. We made a two-way facility here. It squares up, and now we stop. You get the, con you know, you get the constant of the vehicle, so it uh, actually we will uh, do compliance. And then the uh, tough geometry of how people can move through, uh, it's at a very low speed, again, so uh, it's really good. Really well. uh, we extended the uh, bike facility to the north, and connected to it, uh, a feature so uh, really what we want to do is use, utilize these to uh, achieve our outcomes and you know, really challenge our, uh, what we use as standards and make it really uh, accessible and flexible for the community, uh, remove barriers that we have, uh, leverage success and spread the benefit for our entire city. And we also want to spread it for uh, our uh, engineering profession. Uh, build the capacity in our community so that it's a institutionalized process so that it can uh, again, be utilized uh, as we uh, depart our uh, jobs. So we have to think about serving our communities better. Here's a location where Susan McLaughlin back there is working with the community to say, how can we make this street better, right? So you know, we can do a place street. And we thought, we don't really need this street because there's a surrounding uh, uh, area that we can go around. So we closed it. Uh, it's painted, uh, they say, a graphic design by the community. And uh, you know, doing some fun things to really activate that space. There's a park right here that kids are going to play. If I was a kid, this is a natural location where I would take my bike and do a little hop. <laughs> so again, uh, think about your uh, streets differently. How do you serve them better? Thank you very much. So I'm kind of jealous that all these partners kind of came together to do it. So today I'm here to talk about a project that we did in St. Louis, Missouri around, again, lighter, quicker, cheaper projects. We call them pop-up traffic comic demonstrations. So to give a little bit of background, the Governor's Highway Safety Association earlier this year predicted that there was going to be about a 10% increase in the number of pedestrians killed in motor vehicle crashes in 2015. NHTSA came out with a report a few weeks ago saying that that was correct. It was about a 7.2% increase, and now this is only in September, and there's a big call for action of how do we address this? There's people dying in the street or in a car that really shouldn't be in that. All traffic deaths can be avoidable. So I just want to take a moment to thank the partners that made this project feasible and happening. It's through the Plan for Health project. Uh, there's over 30 coalitions. It's funded through the CDC. And it's a partnership between the American Planning Association and the American Public Health Association to bridge together the connection between planning and public health. And our state EPA chapter in the city were really involved throughout the whole process as well. So I just want to give a quick background in the city of St. Louis, what our statistics are and why this project was really influential is that 27% of City of St. Louis residents report no type of leisure time physical activity. 
but 80% of those residents live within a half mile of the public park. So this is already a large public health issue, but then we go into looking at more of a planning and safety issue. In the U.S., 12% of fatal traffic traffic crashes involve people who are walking in the city of St. Louis, that figure is 36%. On top of that, we're also known as a focus city for the high number of pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities that we have. In 2015, we had the most traffic fatalities of, for pedestrians in the last 30 years. So coming together, we were really talking about, well, what's the issue? What's going on? And it's really talking about safer street design. A lot of St. Louis streets are really overbuilt. And without good traffic calming solutions, it was causing people, of course, to drive too quickly. So during this presentation, I'm going to cover top 10 takeaways that when you guys leave this room, what I really wanted to share about the project and what, from my standpoint, were really the important highlights of the project. So the first thing to do for us through this project was to define success. What is the purpose of the demonstration? If we can't answer what we're trying to do as our outcome and our impact, then maybe we shouldn't be doing it at all. So it's really understanding who are we going to involve stakeholder-wise from the city and the community, and really thinking about what's that overall impact that we wanted to do with the project. Another neat concept we did during the pop-up demonstration preparations is that we took city staff and did what we called study tours. In the city of St. Louis, a lot of residents always say, it's great, it works in Portland, Seattle, Vancouver. It wouldn't work in our city itself. So we actually took them to Kansas City, that's in Missouri, and the Kansas City suburbs, and seeing what they're doing around traffic calming. And it was a great way to get these city staff and elected officials together in one place to really talk about, yes, it can happen within our state, and it can happen in the city of St. Louis. So, Quick thing I'm going to talk about is that everyone always asks, how do you do your materials? What sort of materials do you need to do pop-up demonstrations? Well, what we got were a bunch of tires donated from auto shops. We just got a bunch of spray paint, sprayed them in bright, vibrant colors. We got really cheap cones off of Amazon. It was the quickest and fastest way for me to find a bunch of colorful cones. The city wanted us to make sure it would stand out during the demonstrations, so we also added reflective tape on the tips of them. And for anything else that we couldn't really repurpose or buy ourselves, we just shopped fake plants, wayfinding signs, whatever we could, and obviously to have fun while you're developing materials as well. Uh, another really key important thing for us is that we had what we call community champions during the project. They're essentially community liaisons. We gave them a stipend to help us with our public outreach because they're the ones who know the community, who we're trying to buy in, and who, what the purpose is. So we really wanted them to be equally involved with the project and have a sense of buy-in as well. And of course, it comes to the demonstration purposes too. While you're thinking of these pop-up or tactical urban projects, you really need to think about, again, what's the purpose of the site? What's the street care? Um, street characteristics that you're gonna take into consideration? Who owns the street? Is there access to a bathroom uh, for the, your volunteers that are involved in what you're trying to do ultimately through that? And we also, the really great part about this project is that all the materials that you see in the images I'm using is that we created a Trek the Calming lending library. So essentially it's a free lending library for the most part. We just ask people to help cover our time to give them the equipment. And they can come check out the equipment themselves and mimic and do these different demonstrations. And it's also thinking about what your media strategy is. So you're doing these great projects, but you want to make sure the public is aware and they know what you're trying to do. So we did a lot of press releases, we did timeline outcomes of what we're trying to do with each media, and we created really great videos. If you just YouTube Trailnet Plan for Help, there's two videos that you can find. One of them is a five minute video going over the project, but the other one that I actually like better is a little bit longer, and it's a community perspective on the project and why this is important to them and why they wanted to be involved. So another great takeaway you could take is that Trailnet actually created something called the Sawyer Street How-To Guide. It's a book that I wrote of step-by-step -step guidelines of everything that we did in the project, our thought process and what went into it. So if you're new to using the whole LQC idea or what you're trying to do, this is a great resource in my opinion. Obviously I'm really biased <laughs> for you guys to use. Um, you can find it online on our website. 
if you want, feel free to come after this presentation, give me your card, and I'll shoot you an email with it. And Trailnet has some hard copies as well if you'd like us to mail it. So, the biggest question you get is, well, what was your impact? You do these lighter, paper, cheaper projects, but what happens in the long run? And for us, it was bringing the mayor and the city bike pad coordinator, talking to this community member about what we're trying to do. She was letting me know that she's been trying to invite the mayor ever since he's been in office to come to their neighborhood and learn about what's going on. And this is the first time the mayor actually came, and it was a great opportunity to bridge that connection between the city and the community. But the greatest impact actually is that each of our demonstrations we've done, we've already brought in some sort of permanent change. The largest change is a crosswalk improvement by this elementary school. It was over $30,000. We were able to bring in a permanent crosswalk and a bump up based off of the demonstrations that we had done in that area. So what the future implications are, what we're trying to do is that one major part of why this project even came together in the first place is that we want the city of St. Louis to start thinking about having some sort of track of common policy in place. Because in the community, there was a lot of pushback. People didn't understand what track of common was and what that even means. And it's, they didn't understand that it was a good benefit for them because they were complaining about how cars are going too fast in these residential streets. And the great outcome is that in that year that we've been working on the project, the city has come up with a track of common policy that the mayor has signed and it's in place. And all those projects that already have brought in some sort of permanent change and is just continuing and promoting the use of the lending library and helping people really visualize how we can create super streets by using these tactical urbanism projects. So um, here's our contact info. Thank you for being a part of our session and we're going to just open it up to Q&A. So please let us know if you have any questions. Does anyone want to go first? traffic engineers, so they had a sense of what was doable, although some were extremely bold projects like, you know, 2,000 feet of protected bike lane on the Seattle's most dangerous street. So, so we had a lot of convincing to do once we selected those, those five winners among the 30 applicants. On the city side, yeah. On the city side, the implementation, uh, we already have a plan that goes through all the filters of equity uh, and uh, priority for safety. And so those are already uh, in place. Uh, where there's opportunities like the uh, Callan Place and 15th and Ravenna, uh, we already had a project. It's a natural connection. And so it allowed us to extend our project that was already in place. Thank you for a really great presentation. My name is Lee from the County of Hawaii. And I have two questions, so if that's okay. Um, first question is, in our county, we have in our ordinance that anytime we make any kind of change on the street, we have to get a council resolution and council approval, which makes it really difficult to do anything just like an overnight project. So I'm curious if any of you have had something like that and how you dealt with that, if you have it. And I'll give you the first question. <laughs> Uh, so for Seattle, the municipal code is set up so that uh, the, uh, the operation of the street is under the authority of ESTA, the Department of Transportation, and then uh, uh, primarily uh, under the city traffic engineer. Uh, so uh, a lot of the review is done internally in, in our group. Well, for the state, yes. from the St. Louis perspective, anything with these pop-up demonstrations, it's basically just through our public works and they actually asked us to create pretty detailed site plans that were up to engineering standards and using engineering signage as well so hopefully Tomo doesn't do that to his people <laughs> but it was fine it wasn't actually they didn't mind 
that I wasn't, I don't have an engineering background and I made up the site plans. Um, they just wanted to look a little bit more official. So Lee, I think one thing that I might recommend uh, for the county and, and the city is to uh, develop a program like this and the council provide legislation so that it could happen. So it's not, so it's repeatable, it's, uh, it's, it's already codified and makes it easier to Thank you, yeah, I think. I think. One, one more thing is I would recommend not, uh, if you do put that code into place, don't require engineering drawings for them because that kind of defeats the whole purpose of a pop-up. And, you know, I mean, you saw the one example I have of, on the back of a napkin. I mean, I think that that's the kind of thing that you actually want. As long as the, the city engineer agrees that it can be safe, you should be able to put those kinds of projects in as, uh, for a temporary. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is, uh, sometimes it takes time for people to get used to a change. And we've, we've had, you know, harder, not quick, cheap things that we put in. And for the first, I you know, a few weeks, a few months, we get like, oh, this is horrible. And then all of a sudden, everybody loves it and doesn't want to change it. Um, so I'm curious with pop-ups, um, how do you deal with that when you're putting it up and taking it down quickly? Does that really give you enough time to evaluate how it works and then moving into something permanent? Like, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, so we actually did some evaluation that um, of the pop-ups. We collected data on a non-demonstration day and a demonstration day, and we measured some pretty simple stuff. Speed, stop sign compliance, and qualitative data on survey responses of what people envisioned the street, how they felt about it, and how they felt about the idea of putting in that permanent infrastructure if, through the pop-up that we were doing. So it, to the city, they actually kind of liked that. It gave them an initial idea of if it's a good idea or not, if they need to explore it further, if the feedback that we got was positive, and for the most part, all the demonstrations we've done have gotten positive feedback. For uh, Seattle, we actually have a group, uh, which Susan McLeod from back there uh, is part of, an uh, amazing group, and there's actually a planning in place that uh, looks at the uh, effectiveness. So there's surveys that are done, ensure that uh, we get uh, the desired outcome, which is a uh, uh, community coming out, utilizing and having a very positive impact. And if it's not, it's set up so that it can go away. If it's very positive and people want it, then there's a pathway to make it permanent. Okay, a couple more quick questions. So, and this, this is the argument that I'm always having with Don Ho, is that we need community to be able to do those projects, not just the Department of Transportation to do those, those, those street safety improvements. And I think that we would like to have those, those projects in place for more than a day or two, because I, we are collecting data as well about failure, failure to yield because we do we do need the data, but we can't collect really effective data or get very good community feedback in just a day. Hey there, so um, I just had a question about what was your community engagement strategy? So I know that you said you went out to you did a lot of media outreach, but on the level of community outreach, what, what did that entail? So if I did a quick overview of what our community outreach was, that we actually did worked with a local coalition that picked out neighborhoods of highest need in the city of St. Louis, and then we actually conducted walk audits with key community partners, and we walked around different areas within their neighborhood, and then using the walk audit scores that we got back, we chose the area that seemed to be the most suited of what the residents in that area wanted to see. So originally we envisioned doing these pop-up demonstrations on non-residential streets, but a lot of the feedback we got during the walk audit was it was the res residential streets that the community was more interested in doing these demonstrations. So from there, they put a lot of trust in us to come up with the design that might be feasible in that area. And we worked with the city, created the site plan, those community champions that were the real reason that our community outreach I think was so effective and we created those videos as well to educate the public on what the project was and what the purpose was. For the project at 6 and 65th we leveraged um, I guess what you would call Grace a community champion. Um, we were able to identify somebody that lived literally you know on the street where our project was happening and she had relationships um, with business owners and residents. And so we were able to get over 30 letters of support um, after we did the installation. So what we were able to do was point to the project to illustrate, hey, this is what we did. Now we're really interested in moving it forward to be implemented permanently. 
we're, gonna, we're applying for uh, what's called a neighborhood uh, street and parks fund, and we needed letters of support uh, to move that forward. So that was really easy for us to do, or easier for us to do, since that we had the demonstration project to point people to um, as an example for how it happened. Um, uh, citywide, we have a really strong coalition led by Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and with kind of the, the breakout being Seattle Neighborhood Greenways is this, this umbrella, and then there are the uh, neighborhood organizations. So each neighborhood organization really acts as the, the advocacy group within um, a, uh, a really defined uh, area. One final question. John? There, right there. <laughs> I guess I have more uh, technical question about the uh, implementation project, uh, the, the temporary design. Uh, so, I would like to make a comment on how you implemented it in terms of like, what's done with the hand, like, how did you make sure to ensure that it was successful in terms of the demonstration? You should start. Yeah. Um, um, it really depended on what we were trying to measure during the demonstration. So the city actually challenged us to do a longer demonstration. It was all within a day though, longer as in, we were thinking about maybe we'll just grab morning rough, rush hour traffic on a weekday by the school to see what that's like. And they're like, well, don't you want that afternoon traffic too to see what that pattern might be? And we're like, yeah, if you're okay with us doing like an eight to 12 hour demonstration, then we'll do it. So for us, that's kind of where it came down to seeing what was the best use of what we were trying to measure that day. So if you're doing it on local business street, maybe a weekend is better to get more foot traffic and more people to see it. But for us, it was just on residential streets um, where people wanted to know what on an average day their traffic was like and not on a weekend where there might be less traffic on that street. I'm not quite sure I heard the, the whole question, but that's so just kind of going off what Grace said. Um, in terms of the, the visibility of the project, we um, uh, there was a there was a there was a, a good element of surprise that I was hearing over and over again through folks that came that happened upon the project, um, and that was the kind of um, across different demographics. Our project was in front of a bar. And there's a lot of loitering outside of that bar. And we were potentially concerned of conflicts between folks walking and biking across the sidewalk and a uh, congregation that you often see outside of that bar. But it was uh, really, um, uh, folks got along. And it actually seemed to bring people together in a kind of a, uh, kind of a joint uh, uh, kind of shared success of, hey, we can we can walk across the street easier. It was just like, a, hey, did you, did you get that? It was just kind of like, this is pretty cool. Um, but in, so th there was a lot of surprises um, from people in different demographics that we weren't necessarily expecting. And I think the pro projects need to be installed longer um, over different times and different days to allow those unexpected uh, highlights to really bubble up. Yeah, so uh, we have regular parking day on Friday, and then we do have <laughs> parking day plus. Yeah. That allows us uh, to have those uh, uh, demonstrations uh, longer. So, uh, we're being, uh, again, uh, trying to innovate and trying to uh, accomplish uh, what, uh, what we can do together to have more exposure. Well, tragically, we are all out of time. Thank you very much to our panel, Kathy, Chris, Scott, and Grace. Thank you for coming.